Yes, I'd like to say I actually spent a fair bit of time with uh, fishermen from actually from Japan because where I come from in Solomon Islands, that's where uh, Maruha, uh, which was what it, I believe it's one of your largest companies here at, at some stage before, they had a fishing company there, which was a joint venture with uh, the Solomon Islands government. And actually that's where I come from, where they had their company. So I grew up with some of these old fishermen from Okinawa. I think I acquired the taste for sashimi from those who, in the village, from Solomon Islands. Not, it's not something that I acquired working in the tuna industry because we had the tuna industry. We grew up with the tuna industry, with the Japanese and so on. I've had, I've got very fond memories um, because I think our tuna industry in Solomon Islands is very well rooted. Long history. We, we used to have, uh, until 2000, that, that association with Japan. So yeah, personally, that's my, that's my association. I think um, traditionally and historically, we must not forget the long association between the Pacific Islands and Japan that goes right back to the beginning of the last century. You know, they, Japan, we often forget now that Japan literally started the tuna industry in the Pacific. Um, and we also forget that Japan was a, was a colonizing power in, in the Pacific. And so that relationship is still very strong, I think. Um, right across, especially Micronesia, where I where I live, it's it's manifested in the names of people. Um, it's also manifested also in families, yeah? families who have still have their bare Japanese surnames. So that relationship, I think we shouldn't forget that um, we have a shared history, tradition. We tend to forget now, and we look at the Western countries like Australia and New Zealand and the others, but we forget that Japan was in our region and had a bigger influence in our region well before those, I mean, what we have in today's political climate. Eh? If you're looking for milestones as what are the most transformative uh, things that have happened in the Pacific Islands, the establishment of the PNA office in 2010, plus the assertion, I think, th this, the implementation and full development of this vessel day scheme, these instruments of rights-based instruments driven by the PNA have been probably, in my personal view, been the largest transformative uh, thing that has happened in, in the Pacific. Um, and largely in shaping the Pacific, I think what we need to appreciate is that much of this has come about also because there's been changes that, have, that we've seen in the international fisheries dy um, dynamics. You've got uh, this tuna commission that provides the framework under which we are allowed to then uh, develop limits. And then the PNA have taken advantage of those. Um, you know, I, I must point out that there's no other grouping of countries for whom the, the, the tuna is more important than the small island countries of the Pacific. And uh, I always say that others have choices that they can make for economic development, whereas we have very little uh, choices. We only have the fisheries resources and that's what has driven us and driven me in particular um, to, sh to, re to shape this. And I I'll tell you what has also driven me very much is my, uh, my, my growth with the tuna industry in Solomon. My association with the, with the, with the Japanese and I've, I've seen what the tuna industry can, can do for our small economies and, and, and villages. And I know that um, I used to personally go and sell fish myself eh? and that has had a big influence on me in shaping the way in which we want to ensure that we 
get a bigger and fairer share of the, the benefits from these resources. Um, and that's basically what, what has driven us. And I, if I can say, because I know this is an important, the people often wonder, capitalism was based on private property rights and, and, and the, the accumulation of, of those rights in terms of the, the limits that they, and the scarcity and the power that those rights create. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are simply establishing our private property rights over our resources and adding value to them in ways that improve the economic and social benefits of the countries. And I, 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 I like to say that, you know, it's not rocket science. Eh? Um, I often say that those are things that we just learn, we've learned those values from the Americans and we're just trying to apply that to our tuna resources. And it's, it's had a huge impact. Um, it hasn't been easy. Um, it hasn't been easy to get to where we are because there's just so many difficulties and of course there are people who are opposed to what we're doing, naturally, um, because there's many different interests. Um, and trying to get and work with these different governments is, is always a challenge. But I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done and what we've achieved. Let me just say that, first of all, Japan is a very important development partner to the Pacific Island countries. And I think, to that extent, Japan will always be an important development partner. Um, when many of our countries became independent in the early 70s, or even some of them before the 70s, they had already developed some ties with, with Japan. And so it, it, didn't come, it doesn't come as a surprise that some of the very first agreements that uh, these independent Pacific Island countries signed when they became independent was with Japan, uh, largely because it was based around fisheries. Eh? And there was a very strong link at the time with Japanese fishing access and, and aid. And, and up until today, so Japan, if I may just qualify my statement by saying that Japan continues to be an important partner to the Pacific Island countries. It's just that in the last few years, as countries have, have developed and they um, have more choices now, the, the national interests are a bit more defined. You know, when we, in the 70s, it was, the, the world was divided up between the Soviet Union and the US. So you, you, was, you, you didn't sit on the fence. But I think with the breakdown of all those now, you see a lot more choices and then you, so you've got national interests that are more prominent now. And so you're seeing the emergence of China. You're also seeing the emergence of, um, of, of Russia. Uh, even Cuba is becoming an important player in the health regime in, in the Pacific. And no one ever imagined that we would actually have diplomatic relations and actually be sending our students to Cuba, but, but it's happening. So the, the world is, is changing and with that too, I think our reliance on Japan as, as a primary source of development uh, provider has, has also reduced. And so um, for me, what I'd like to see in the long term is our development partnership should, should be about promoting independence of, of our countries. And so we all have a role to play, but I don't want us to see, I don't want to see us being totally dependent on, on, on others because, you know, I'm conscious that is your hard earned taxpayers' money that is being used to support the countries. And so I would rather like to see working with the, the donors like Japan, the European Union to support us to, to graduate out of aid dependency, not to become, to, to depend on aid all the time. I think there is a role for, for us. There's a lot of things that we can learn from Japan and we should learn from Japan. Japan has been able to demonstrate that it, it is a country that can uh, develop from very limited natural resources. It's invested in its people. 
um, research and development is a very important thing in Japan. Your s technology is up there, largely because of the investments that you've made in research and, and science and, and technology. And, and it's your people that you have invested in. And I'd like to see those kind of values being shared with us because, you know, ultimately we can only help ourselves. When you look at the Pacific, I know on a per capita basis we are probably the most aid dependent region in, in the world. Um, but we are a region that has a lot of potential too. And I think it's up to our leaders to, to work and design those kind of things that I'm saying now like working with Japan and the others so that we graduate out of a dependency. I think you're playing a, a wonderful role in bringing a better understanding for, from us. There is an important uh, partnership role that that you can play in bridging that understanding. There is a limit, I think, to government-to-government -government relationships that is, it's very well defined and, and confined, you know, what I mean, to rules and uh, other things, whereas you have, you're not constrained by the confines of diplomacy. And so you are able to reach out to others within Japan and also in, in the Pacific Island country. So I think you're providing a very important opportunity. And I'd encourage you to, to continue to build on that. Because it's not just bringing people like myself to talk about fisheries, but there's a whole range of issues that are affecting the region. Um, the Pacific, we, we should not underestimate the importance of the Pacific Ocean where the Pacific Island countries are situated. Is that the, the climatic conditions and the, the oceanographic conditions of the Pacific Ocean has global ramifications for weather patterns and storms in Europe and in, in so we can't underestimate the significance of that. And I think to that extent, you have an important role in bringing us and bringing that understanding and that dialogue that governments won't be able to do.